Okay, family camp is always a wonderful time, like meeting old friends, making new friends, right? And, and that is really special. Um, at our church camp, it's, we don't just have one church. We really actually have two churches here tonight. And it's always a special joy and uh, desire to see joint ministry between Bethel and Bethany. And so, uh, we have a pastoral team here. Uh, used to be, it was only pastor. He represented Bethany. And coming over here for the last 24 years over here at Bethel. And then now, a whole team coming as well. So each session, we will have a t uh, people coming up and we will have a time of worship together. In the evenings, we will have a team, what we call the future leaders. And God willing, He will raise up future leaders. This whole camp is prepared by a group, a team together. And they have worked so hard. Uh, some of them are here, some of them are not. They are running the children's program. And they are quite a number of kids and they are all very excited. And it's very difficult, parents know. Excited kids combine, multiply them. And so they are all over at the other side and they have a program. At each night, you will have one of them, or paired up, will be sharing and leading us in a time of worship. In the mornings, we will have the pastoral team. Right? And... Um, let me introduce them to you again. Just then you only saw their pictures because some of you were asking, who's this one, who's that one? I might as well, let's, let's uh, clear it and, and settle it and, and let me just introduce you, uh, them to you again. This is uh, student pastor Jonathan Jacob. And we know him because he used to study in Perth. And now he is studying again. Well, better. And this is our student pastor, Moses. <laughs> student pastor, Eugene. We have two no longer student pastors, recently become intern pastors, Ben and Ben. I asked Ben how you feel. He said intern pastor, he told me stands for intense pressure. What does SP stand for? And so each in the morning, they will be taking us and leading us at the time of singing together, worship together, and we just look forward to their fellowship, looking forward to them being here. And that is the beauty of fellowship, that we learn together, a beauty of camp ministry. And we hope that your hearts could be really greatly encouraged. Okay, we have a little Bible memory verse cards for you, if you would take a look at them. All printed out for you to encourage you uh, to love the Lord's Word. And it is possible. Okay, really possible. And, and uh, we look forward to a time of learning. So the first part of it, we just got to devote a bit of time to worshiping together. I'm going to ask you to pray with me, and then we will begin uh, you know, a time of singing together. And it's, it can be uplifting where we can learn to sing together and enjoy focusing on the Lord. Some of you have taken leave to be here. Some of you have set aside time to be here and that's good and you're searching for something that could really encourage well let worship be a time of encouragement to all our hearts well let's pray together for a while our father we thank you so much for your goodness to us help us at this camp to discover you afresh sometimes we take that for granted Sometimes we are so caught up with life itself 
we lose sight that you are there. Help us, Father, to focus on you tonight. May we worship you afresh. We ask that you would help us to do this through singing, through listening, through words of encouragement that could encourage our hearts to look to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The first song that we are going to sing together is simply entitled, Worthy of Worship. You know, why do we put so much effort into all these things? The pastoral team, just a few weeks ago, they were in Myanmar. And now they are here. They have left wives to be here. Some wife to be. <laughs> Not to give it away. But you know, you leave, you set aside, you're away from home just to be here. What is that for? And you know, for us, it's, is it worth it? The Lord is worthy of our worship, worthy of our adoration, worthy of our love, worthy. And, and as we sing together, but let's, let's be able to sing to the Lord. Let's look to Him as we prepare our hearts to seek Him. Well, let's sing this together, worthy of worship. Family camp time is also marks the holiday times for the children. It also means the end of term. And for those of us who are parents, it's, for me anyway, it, it feels like it has been a very, very full term. And so many things has happened. And as I reflect, the heart is just filled with thankfulness. I would just want to share with you um, some of these reasons. James in particular, my, my son, and uh, he's very, very happy uh, to be at camp. Uh, my, two my two kids are. James, this is his first time attending a program. And he just told me uh, then that in five minutes we will go to our class. It's his first time attending the class. I look at him and I smile. He doesn't have a watch. Is it five minutes i have going to class? And there he is. He's just excited. Early on the year, he was having a lot of difficulties. Among the two children, he has the most medical uh, challenges at that point, this point. It came to a point where he asked us, Dad, why do I have to go to hospital so many times? What is wrong with me? My heart really sank when I heard those words as a father. You see, he was having difficulties in initially just writing. And we thought it was nothing. And so uh, the, he was sent to an occupational therapist. And the occupational therapist looked at him and said, I re you should refer him to a, uh, a physio. And so we did. So he went from an OT to a physio. And the next thing we know, he needed to be referred to a specialist, orth orthopedic specialist over there. He did an x-ray and discovered he had hip dysplasia. And we had to... And I was, be honest with you, I was really deeply challenged to look at it. And what he said to me was something that I thought, wow, let's, let's look at it. So we saw the doctors, we saw doctor after doctor. And we finally came to one doctor who told us, you know, look at it. Don't, there's no need for surgery. Okay, but watch him. And so we, uh, he put him on a swimming program. He does a lot of swimming and, and, you know, just, is it over yet? No, we're still watching him. The heart can be filled with trouble. And I don't know, perhaps tonight some of you can come and is the heart filled with thankfulness or filled with trouble? And I chose to be filled with thankfulness each day. And it was a conscious choice to make, to learn to trust the Lord afresh, 
to learn to pray for James, to do whatever a father could do for his son. You know, to, to see him run about, thankfulness. To see him be happy, wanting to go to class, thankfulness. My heart is filled with thankfulness. As I think of camp tonight, thankfulness. I just want to say thank you for those who have supported in camp. Pastor Charlie comes every year, and every year, without fail, he asks the same question. Are there any needs for camp? He's the camp speaker, and he often gives towards camp. And I'm just deeply encouraged by his example. I just shared with him, this, this year, Pastor, before we even start, the sponsorship that come, no need to pay camp fees. Now, it doesn't mean you don't pay camp fees next year, okay? <laughs> it doesn't mean a thing. But it was just encouraging to see you believing in this ministry, to see people say, you know what, we support this. My heart is filled with thankfulness. And let's sing this together. Even as those of us who are parents, with children, perhaps with challenges, can our heart be filled with thankfulness? Yes, look to the Lord. And that's my encouragement uh, to you tonight. Look to the Lord. Let that heart be filled with thankfulness. Well, let's sing this together. We can give thanks to the Lord in many ways. Take a look at the verse that, sings, that begins. My heart is filled with thankfulness. Bring to the Lord, to Him who bore my pain, who plumbed the depths of my disgrace and gave me life again. Let's sing this together. My heart is filled with thankfulness. The camp theme for this year is taken from Psalm 119. In fact, it's in your Bible memory verse, if you would take a look at it. From verse 47 and verse 48. Well, let's read this together. Have you got it? And let's try and read this together. Okay, well, may, may we even hide it in our heart. It will be wonderful. Okay, well, let's try this. And I will delight myself in your commandments, which I love. My hands also I will lift up to your commandments, which I love. And I will meditate on your statutes. Okay, good. Did you pick up a typo there? Yeah, which love? There's a typo there. Okay, which I love. I'm glad you say which I love. You didn't say which love. Okay, so reading the Bible would be, would be wonderful. Okay, there will be typos. But this is our theme for this year. Your commandments, which I love love. And this is something I think we all a little bit, perhaps, uh, perhaps it is hard. Do I really love God's Word? And perhaps the answer is, if we're honest, no. You know, but it begins with God first. And we know God. Discover the God that He is. And you know that this is a God who is there and He loves us. You know, we can learn to love His Word. You love the words of, of the person when you discover so much more about the person himself. Another um, reason for being thankful is uh, Christabel. And um, she started out, this, she just ended her, her term, and they ended with a little violin concert at school. And so they had all the people playing, and it goes on for one hour, just to hear your daughter play for two minutes. That's what it is. And you know, that is worth it all. Chrissy has been playing the violin for five years now. And, you know, I was just beaming with joy and pride to hear her play with so much strength, you know, with more confidence, and she can play the piece well. In my heart, well. She's not the greatest violinist in the whole thing. But, you know, 
when she played, I'm just beaming with joy. Reason is, when she first started out, she did not delight in violin. She liked it, but she was, it was, did she love it? Not really. I remember she saying, I, I, Dad, I remember that, that one day she, she said, Dad, I just want to give up. I'm no good. I can't play this. That was five years ago. I remember saying to her, Chrissy, I, I can't teach you the violin. I'm no good. I, I can't be there to do all that. But you know what? I will be here for, for you. Don't give up. You can do this. Keep trying. Keep at it. Year, one year, two year. It, you, will, you have to endure all this. Violin is not a very pleasant sound when you don't play the right notes. Right? All those who have heard, you know, have it, understand that. Oh, is it good? Yeah. And I remember what she played. There was one concert she played, and she played it totally off. I stood up and I clapped. She, I've just got to be there for her. Don't give up. You know, sometimes we give up too, and I can understand that. A love for God's Word, it's, it's not easy with anything. You don't begin with love. I will tell you, something, it doesn't come easy. But when you struggle with it, it's only when you struggle with it, and then you begin to love it. It goes through struggle. Keep on at it. Don't give up. And sometimes I remind myself of the same thing. Wow, this is difficult. It is difficult. And we want to give up. It's so hard to understand. So many verses, so many passages, so many things I don't know. And we just feel like giving up. And I said, don't give up to my daughter. We're reminded that we have a God that doesn't give up on us. Don't give up. The next song that we're going to sing together is entitled, Where Else Have We to Go? These were the words of Peter himself. And one day Jesus taught the multitude and the people couldn't understand the, the depth of the truth and they left. And they said, this is too hard and they left. And Jesus said to the disciples, do you also want to go away? And Peter, the disciples, a group of them said, where else have we to go? You have the words of eternal life. Don't give up. Well, keep trying. Or sometimes we feel like we want to give up too. Uh, and, and sometimes pastor will teach and he will ask the pastors, ask us, um, do you understand? Look at it blankly. We actually don't understand. And uh, just glad he doesn't say, do you also want to go away? The reply, where else have we to go? Yeah. On, the, on the road from the airport to the hotel, pastor was asking me, Chris, you know, on the pulpit message on reconciliation, how did you, what did you say? Oh, that was very difficult. My reply was not what you said. <laughs> because I know what he would say would be far above and beyond what I would. And then I asked him, so what did you say? And then he told me, he explained the entire text in one word, reconciliation. So I said, you just confirmed it. <laughs> you know, he's so far ahead. How can I ever reach that level? Sometimes I feel like giving up. I just told my daughter not to give up. Have I found a delight yet? The, the scriptures told me, I delight. You know what? Press on. Keep at it. Go again. Let's work at it. Thank God there are people who will be with us. They don't give up on you. And we're not going to give up on you. We're here for you. This is what family camp is about. Don't feel intimidated. You could have perhaps here and you feel you really, I don't know. And we've got to be here for you the whole week. Let's learn. Let's discover this wonderful God who is there for us. And we can discover Him through His Word.
Where else have we to go? You have the words of eternal life. Let's keep following the Lord. Let's seek Him. Well, let's sing one more song together. Thank you. Well, let's welcome Pastor Charlie. Last time he came, we missed him on the weekend. He had, it, he had to return back to Bethany. This week, good news, we have him the whole week. Say thank you to Bethany for us. Um, we got a mic here? Okay, good. Thanks. I'm really looking forward to uh, more ways than one to take up the next part of Psalm 119. And uh, you know, the whole challenge is this time to we look at the earlier part and now we move on to the next part. The first time we introduced was just simply the Word of God how to look at the Word of God, how to understand it, how to apply it, and this time, how to love it. And believe me, if we are honest with ourselves, we don't know how to love the Word of God. So I'm going to, I'm going to share a lot of things with you. Uh, I'm going to work with you through the notes and then um, to share with you the things that we want to try and attempt and then to accomplish and why we emphasize the Word of God the way we do. I think this is something that we want to take a look at. Uh, really, really, uh, we're not great, <coughs> greatly challenged to do this. Okay, well, let's, let's pray together before we begin. Once again, we cry out to you, Lord, following the example of the Psalmist, to ask you to open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things out of your law. We pray that you will help us to look at some of the goals that we ought to set for ourselves when we read your word. And we pray that you will teach us how we can read with goals in mind. And we pray for your blessings. In Jesus' name, Amen. Okay, we're going to take a look at your page uh, right now. The, the notes are not very much, okay? And since the camp is on this theme of love for God's Word, and 47, 48, right? And I will delight myself in the commandments which I love. Now, I'm not so sure that we can actually say that with an honest face, because most of us don't have a love for God's Word. Reading it is not love for it. Paying attention to it is not really love for it. In fact, many people read God's Word so that the conscience will keep quiet. If you don't read it, it bothers you. Something's missing you. So then you read the, the conscience, okay, it keeps quiet. Well, some consciences are easily satisfied. Some consciences student pastors, pastors, that is not going to be good. Because, I mean, that's, that's a reality. So one of the goals, that, let's try to ask ourselves why there is that lack. Well, this is important. Why do I lack? <coughs> I mean, let's be honest with, about, about things, okay? Number two, how do we actually cultivate a love for anything? Right? See, most of us, when we grow up, what we eat today is basically what we liked when we were kids. It's very hard to appreciate things like bitter gourd when you are older. You take one taste and thank you very much. Don't like it. Until you grow up with it, then it becomes a part of you. Otherwise, it's very hard to cultivate. So how do we actually cultivate? Well, let's consider this. Okay? And this is important. This is the thing. This is for the student pastors and, and our intern pastors there. Right? And this is important for us. Not, not intense pressure. Important pressure. <laughs> because without pressure, you can't do anything. You need that pressure. This one is important. How do we really love God's Word in such a way it will impact our life and our ministry? 
Now, I, I went through a classic way of preparing for ministry. So, you know, did years in a, doing a bachelor's program, moving on to a master's program, going to a doctor's program. What did I learn from it? Not to repeat, to get others to repeat what I went through. It took me years of careful study to realize what's really missing. The Word of God that impacts the life and ministry. And very few people can, can tell you that just because they've gone to seminary or Bible school somewhere, they know they love the Lord's Word. In fact, they don't. One of the hardest people to teach are pastors and seminary people. I do that all the time. I, I go to Burma and I teach pastors. And one of the hardest things to do is to teach them. Why? Because the love for God's Word is just not there. So I really want to share with them whatever we, we can, how to develop, how do we cultivate, and then to find our own personal love for the Lord's Word. It's hard. How long has it taken me to really cultivate a love for God's Word? A lifetime. Reading it, understanding it is one thing. To actually love the Lord's Word is another thing. We can't figure it out easily. Why don't we naturally love the Lord's Word? Now we're going to figure that out. This is some of the goals. So I, I really hope that you will be honest with yourself as you come to camp. And you know, your desire to be here is that you want to learn how to cultivate a love for God's Word. Now that's a goal. It's not going to be easily achieved. Let me warn you. Right? People take a love for they can pick up a love for movies, for food, for fellowship, for activity, easily. But love for God's Word. Not too many people can honestly say they really love God's Word. There was a man that I was his life was reading uh, or rereading. And his name was called Jonathan Goforth. Now he went over to China to become a missionary. And he became a very successful missionary, but he went through a lot of hard times. His children died in, 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 uh, in China. He boxer rebellion, much suffering, loss of a lot of things. What kept him going? The Word of God. When he was in his 60s, when he became blind, he had almost memorized a great portion of the Scriptures. How many times did he read God's Word over? 73 times. Now that is love for God's Word. That you can read something over and over and over and over again, 73 times. Either you love it or you don't. Now I look at it and I say, wow. That's some challenge. I have way to go yet. Okay? Now, are there texts that I have read many times? Every time I translate, I just finished Second Corinthians. So I've I've translated 26 books of the New Testament. How many times have I gone through those books? Maybe 30 times. Still not 73 times yet. Why would you do it? What draws you to it? Love. Right? I mean, that's what it is. Well, I can understand Chris, uh, uh, Pastor Chris' love for the children. Sure, I can relate to that easily. Right? There's something that 
that is there. I mean, you know, you can, you can, I, I love my son. Now, he's not in primary school. He doesn't have these kind of things that he has today. He's over 40 years old. I still love him very dearly. That's what it is. When you really love year in, year out, year in, year out, you pray, you love that person. It's there. It's for real. And now the grandchildren. Of course. That's what love is. Now you translate the same kind of love to the Word of God. Now, I am not so sure that that love is there. Right? So this is something that we need to ask ourselves. Okay, now, looking at, just to give you a, a, a glimpse of oh, this love for God's Word. We're looking at 47 and 48. Right? So 47, 48, the first expression of love for God's Word was there. 1 to 46, nothing. Does it strike you? You see, this is important. Right? This is absolutely important for us to figure it out. This love doesn't come immediately. It really doesn't. So are there people who love God's Word? Actually, very few people. Now let's take a look at, at the, the things he went through. Okay, I've listed one, two, three, four, five things as you read 1 to 46. Now they're non-exhaustive, but think about this thing here. Okay, let's think about these things here. Almost, well, actually every segment, and there are 22 segments, Every segment is a prayer. A prayer for one thing or another, but not love. I think up to 46. 46 verses, not a word of love, which I think we all can relate to because it doesn't come easily. Well, let, let's take a look at this. Okay, here we go. There were struggles. Struggles with the world, struggles with sin, struggles with affliction, struggles. And the struggles don't help in the cultivation of love. Now that is a problem. Number, number three, there was hope. But hope and love are not the same. I hope. Not exactly the same, right? And of course, what he needed most of all was acquisition. Now that is how it works. Till you have literally, we call this like an acquired taste. You cannot acquire a taste of love for God's word just like that. Right? Eating foie gras is an acquired taste. Many people think that caviar is nice. Have you ever tried it? It's not all that nice. It is an acquired taste. Eating bitter gourd is an acquired taste. Here, acquiring. The acquisition of knowledge must come first. As long as there is very little knowledge, there will never be love. Can't. You cannot speak of love until you really have quite a bit of knowledge of the, of the thing before you can say, I really love it. It's very difficult. Right? And so that is that love. I think that is so absolutely important. So that's what it. Secondly, when we live in a hostile world, you just barely keeping your faith alive is very hard to love. 
That's obvious. So you want to know why we don't love the Lord's Word. Because, you know, there are people who scold you how to love. And it's really, really not easy. And you deal with problem all the time. How do you love when you're trying to cope with all these things here? When people look at you and sneer at you, how do you love the Lord's Word? Very difficult. When there's very little regard for God's Word in the world, it's just not there. It is really a challenge. So that's what we want to look at. Right? So these are the problems that take away that love for God's Word. Now, it's something that we need to think about very carefully. Okay? So how does it begin, bit by bit? A bit of trust. A bit of hope. A bit of desire. A bit of joy. A bit of faith. Now, if all these things are not even there, that love is not going to happen. Okay? Love for God's Word is not the same as love at first sight. It's not. You know, I, I don't know whether actually people can say love at first sight. Most of the time, not true. And most of the love at first sight don't last forever. After a while, not really. What is there to love? Unfortunately. So there are very, very few people who can say they were childhood sweethearts and then they carried on and then they still call each other dear. Some of the reasons why is because over age, over time, they've forgotten the name. <laughs> so easier to... Uh, hello, dear. What was your name? That, I think that, that happens uh, from time to time as we grow older. So as we, as we take a look at it, okay, now this is really cultivating the love of God, uh, a love for God's Word, experiencing mercies, salvation, and then finally, the, your Word which I love. Now I'm going to share with you tonight something that is not in your notes. Okay, uh, so this something which is not in your notes is going to take you into looking at a way of looking at the Word of God. And that will give you a clue as to why we actually don't really know how to love God's Word. Okay, now it's, it's going to be really challenging if you have to be brave to face yourself. I mean, you know, that's how it is. Every time you look in the mirror and you see the first white hair, you... <gasps> then after a while, wow, well, quite a few more, and you sort of get used to it. But you know, it's really very hard to learn how to love the Lord's Word. And I'll tell you what it is that actually hinders us from loving God's Word. Okay? Now, it's, it's, it's going to, I'm going to take you all the way, bit by bit, the first segment, second segment, third segment, fifth segment, I'll show you how it works. Just one little word. And you will understand why that is the, that way. Okay? So I, one of the problems is that we often think that love for God's Word is a feeling. So I, I don't feel very much about God's Word. Well, does the love of God's Word involve feelings? Yes. That's not enough. Feelings don't last. What is it? So when you say, I love God's Word, what are you talking about? What do you mean? What do you really mean when you say, I love God's Word? And most people can't define it. Really, really can't define it. So I'm, I'm going to share with you what it is that actually hinders us. And we need to address this problem. And only when we actually address this problem, then will the possibility of love be there. As in any kind of love, sometimes things block the way of love. Obviously. Right? Misunderstanding, difficulties, problems, 
personality, whatever. Something's hinder. This is a real problem. So I want to share this with you so it's not in your notes that you'll have to pay attention for this one here. This is why I don't always give you all the notes so that you think, well, I really know, I know everything. That's not true. Okay, what is it? Well, let's take a look. Okay, let's, let's take a very, very careful look and see what it is. Segment number one, Aleph. Look at one, three, and five. That you will see a glimpse of this. What is it? Okay. The psalmist begins with observing people who walk in a certain way. Okay, watch. Blessed are the undefiled. And you take a look at it. Why are they undefiled? And then, in the way. Now watch this phrase. Watch the last word. Blessed are the undefiled in the way. Watch this. You see, love is actually a way of life. It's not a moment thing. It's not just a feeling thing. It is actually a way of life. Now, if this love is not our way, it's unnatural. Watch this. Blessed are the undefiled in the way. Now, look at verse 3. Okay? They do no iniquity. They walk in His ways. His ways and the way are now tied in. In verse 5, He has to confess. Okay? Oh, that my ways were directed to keep your commandments, your statutes. So then we begin to realize that there is God's way and there is our way. And they clash. And every time we want to talk about God's way, what gets in the way is our ways. Watch this. Right? What stops you from loving the Lord's Word is your way of life. Right? What stops us from learning the Lord's Word? It's our way. All my ways. An old song, I did it my way. There we go. People like this. I did it my way. And we take great pride in that. Really? Sure, maybe your way, but it may not be God's way. Now, watch this further. As the psalmist expands his thoughts, let's take the next segment. Okay, the next segment is there. Verse 9 to 16. Now, watch this three measures. One, two, three, right? Look at the next segment. Also, one, two, three. Now he realizes, how can a young man, where does he start? He starts from being young. So when you are young, and you did not learn to love God's way, when you are old, you start learning to love the Lord's way, it's so much harder. That is why we have so many difficulties. We did not learn to love the Lord's way at a younger age. But let's start where? Let's start here. How can a young man cleanse what? Not his sins alone, his way. You see, many people confess only sins. What you really want to deal with is your way of life. 
people try to get out of whatever it is, if they can get out of it and do it nicely, they will. How can a young man cleanse his way? There we go. The young man, his way, right? Now, go on further. Take a look at the word, uh, okay? That we see this, I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies. I will, content, I will meditate and contemplate your ways. Now, there we go. His way, your way, and then again, your way. See, there's a clash again. Six times now, in, tw in, in, in uh, 16 verses, way, way, way. You see, if you really want to learn to love the Lord, you've got to watch your way. Not just a feeling, but watch your way. And unless and until our ways are brought to understand and brought in alignment and we look at cleansing our ways, that love will not come, no matter what you do. You can pray about it, and it still will come. Okay, now look at verse uh, 20. The next segment is now segment 4, Dalit word. Watch this very carefully. I have declared my ways. See? Now, wait. Watch this. Again here, we see a pattern. A three mansions. Again. Right? So now we, this is the, all together, we're going to have nine segments, the nine verses already. Um, verse 26. I have declared my ways. You answered me. Make me understand the way of your precepts. Verse 27. Remove from me the way of lying. There we go. So, way, way, way. Can, can you see this? You see, a lot of people can't figure, why is it that I pray about loving God's Word, I still don't love it. I still struggle having to read God's Word. I still don't understand the Lord's Word. Why? Perhaps we have never dealt with the problem of the word, the way. All right? Well, let's go on to a, a yet another uh, segment. Let's, let's take a look very, very carefully. Uh, very quickly. Last one, and then we, we said enough. Verse 30, uh, the segment 5 over here. Okay? From verse 33 down. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes. But this time he adds the word path. Make me walk in the path of your commandments, which is actually the way. Right? Revive me in your way. So now we have one, two, four, five, way, path, way, all the time. If we are going to ask the Lord to help us to love His commandments, we are going to do address more than just that love for His commandment or the lack of it. A whole way of life must change. There's no other way. See, many people think that diet is a matter of what food you eat. Some people have a seafood diet. What they see, they eat. It's called seafood. I see the food. That's my diet. That's it. Because they have all kinds of diet. It's dieting. It's not the answer. It's your way of life. So I've been maintaining my weight for the last 40 years. How? Because it's your way of life. That's how you want to be. That's what you want to do. Right? So this is absolutely important for us to figure out what are we talking about? 
So if we are not willing to address uh, the, the way of our life, we only pray, you please pray for me uh, that I will love God's word. You know what? It's not going to happen. It's not. Until we deal with this idea of the word of God and a way of life. And the psalmist has to look at it very, very carefully. Watch very obviously. There is a great contradiction or distinction between the word my way and God's way. Right? Now, what does it begin? That cleansing must take place. Not a sin alone, but your way of life. Teach me your way. Now, we will take it up again here. The word teach me is used so many times in this particular psalm, 119. And the same way, the word teach me, teach me, teach me, teach me. Let me give you an example. Let's, let's take a look. Okay, let's look at how he wants the Lord to help him. Uh, this idea of teach me. Verse 12, take a look. Teach me your statutes. This is one particular prayer that he will repeat again and again and again. Watch this. I'll show you the number of verses that uses this phrase. Teach me your statutes. Verse 12. Teach me your statutes. Verse 26. Verse 33. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes. 68. Teach me your statutes. 135. Teach me your statutes. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. You watch. There are other words. Make me understand and so on and so forth. But basically, this idea, teach me your statutes. Was there an end? Yes. Finally, he ended this in verse 171. My lips shall utter praise, for you teach me your statutes. Now, that is an interesting prayer. See, most of us are not very serious about asking the Lord to teach. Right? Now, we, we think in terms of, you know, what, what is it we want to do, the Lord to do for us? We want the Lord to answer our prayers. We want the Lord to give us joy. We want the Lord to comfort our hearts. We want the Lord to give us His blessings. Have you ever said to the Lord, Lord, teach me your statutes? See, we don't make that prayer. Oh, maybe we did say once in a while, but this was repeated again and again and again and again. Teach me your statutes. Now, how serious are you? See, if we're not serious about the Lord being the teacher of His Word, the statutes, nothing is going to happen. How serious are we in learning. Psalmist begins, the first segment, when I learn your commandments. See, we, we don't really know how to, to, to look at asking the Lord to teach us. You see, so this is another way that hinders us from really loving your word. All right, let us say the Lord, how would the Lord teach actually? Have you really asked yourself, how would the Lord teach? Supposing we make that prayer, how would the Lord teach? Well, this was a prayer that the Messiah had to make about the Lord teaching him. How would the Lord teach him? Well, let's look at Isaiah chapter 50. And we will catch a glimpse of how the Lord teaches. Right? Well, let's, let's take a look at this very carefully. Okay, verse uh, 4. The Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned. Verse 4. 
He awakens me morning by morning to hear as the Lord did. Now, let us say that the Lord wants to teach you. Let's say tonight you make this your prayer. Right? Lord, teach me your statutes. <clears throat> what would the Lord need to do first? Watch some uh, Isaiah 50, verse 4. Okay? Now, this is important. Okay? One, He awakens me morning by morning. But many people say, well, I'm not a morning person. Really. In the early days of Greece, we don't go to a school to learn. You find one teacher. Just one. Alexander the Great had only one teacher. He brought his friend to study with him. That teacher, that single teacher was Aristotle. One teacher will teach him logic, war, history, language, how to conquer, you name it. One teacher. And where he walked, they walked. They call him a peripatetic teacher where he likes to walk. That's it. Five students. One was a world conqueror. The four students he had became the generals who divided the, the Greek empire into four parts. One teacher. How does he do it? Actually, the pattern is the same. First, he needs to awaken our understanding. Right? Now, this is absolutely, watch this. He awakens me. A lot of people read, but their mind is not there. It's not awakened. How do we have a love for the Lord? He needs to awaken that love. He needs to wake us up. See, the idea of awaken is a person who is sleepy. Worse, the person is dead. The word awaken, used by Paul, awake you who sleep, is actually a reference to that which is dead or dull. You want the Lord to help you to love His word? First, he must wake you up. Wake up. Be awake. Be awakened. Most people uh, will just, well, you know, I'm not like that. I cannot learn like that. I, I don't like reading. I never like reading. You can give yourself a thousand excuses and they may be valid to you. But not to God. How does he do it? He awakens. Now, specifically, he awakens the ear to hear as the learned. And that's what makes one student different from the next. The one who has whose heart, whose mind, whose ear that is awakened listens and hears things that others cannot. Teach me your statutes. This is what God will do. He will teach you. What will He need to do? He needs to wake you up first. He needs to cause you to be awakened first. First, generally. Second, specifically, your ear. Do you hear the Lord speaking to you? Most people don't. And if they do hear, they hear voices. And if you hear voices, go and see a doctor. That, there we go. How does the Lord awake? Now go on further. To hear as the learned. How does a learned person learn? 
Why is the person more learned than the next? Because he puts on a pair of spectacles? Nope. What makes a person learn it? Watch this sense of awakening that was there. When I first went to the US in the eight, early 1980, that was many years ago, I went to, you know, waiting for accommodation. I stayed in my professor's home. And there he was reading the book of Genesis. It was open. His notes were there, and he was reading Genesis. And I looked at him, and I, Genesis? Are you serious? Now, this guy was a Stanford graduate, right? He's one of those people who defends creation. He is a PhD in this area. And he was reading Genesis. My approach then was entirely wrong. I look at him. He had the ear of the learned. I didn't. His ears were awakened. Mine wasn't. Awakening. You see, this is the way of the Lord teaching us. The way of learning to love the Lord is I'm talking to you, you're not listening. I think we all understand. Husbands and wives stop listening to each other. Are you listening? Yeah, yeah, I am. Not really. You are not paying attention. Before marriage, everything you pay attention to. Not only birthday, what hour of birth was remembered? Right? Everything is important. As we grow older, we've forgotten everything. It's very hard to keep a life alert. Awakening is a lifelong thing. It's not here and there. It's not now and then. It is a state of alertness. He has awakened. Once that ear has been awakened, the ear remains awake. That's how it is. So when I read a Greek text, when I hear it expounded, there's a part of me that straight away recognizes it's true or false. It's, it's a part of me. Can't change it. And it affects even the way I, English is read, understood. Same. It affects other aspects. It affects the way I live. It affects the way I write. It affects the way I speak. It affects the way I reason. It affects, it affects the way I come to a conclusion. One will lead to another. This is called the way. It's not a point or two points. It's not beginning and conclusion. It's everything that goes into it. This is why the psalmist knew that he cannot just simply confess sins. He must confess his ways. I have declared my ways before you. You answered me. How does God teach? If I ask you to wake up early in the morning, would you do that? Most people won't. So my discipline at Myanmar, discipline morning before five till midnight. Same this camp before five, midnight. Same discipline. Guess what? It doesn't matter where. And you know what? It's my way of life. After a while, it's just part of you. It's a while you can't, you can't sustain it when you grow older. I am 68 years old. Thank you. I was in the hospital a few days ago to see somebody. 
And one young insurance man came up to me. He said, sir, are you waiting for your wife? And I said, no. Why do you think I'm waiting for my wife? He says, have you upgraded your insurance program? And I said, no, I'm not upgradable. He says, how will you be not upgradable? Of course you can't upgrade. I want to show you a program upgradable. Up to what age? Uh, 65. You're only what? At best, not even 50, right? <laughs> when we 50 something, but still upgradable. I said, I'm beyond the age of being upgraded. Really? But you don't look so old. I don't feel so old either, by the way. <laughs> No, I'm serious. You see, it's a way of life. Right? When people are in their 60s, they think retirement. I don't. Why should we think retirement? 60s are sensational. Right? Isn't it? We just begun a new ministry in Myanmar last year to look at a different type of church growth at 67. That was Jonathan go forth kind of lifestyle. 67, he went to Manchuria to begin a new ministry. You see, it's a way of life. It's not age. Once you start thinking in a certain way that you are old, you not only are old, you feel old, you look old, you think old, and you confirm old. What does old mean? Cold. That's what happens. Come on. You are so much younger. So I, I tell the young, young, youngsters over there, they're half my age. If they cannot keep up, then why be there at each? Right? And I want to share with you, this is what it's all about. So if we really want to talk about, you see, when the Lord loves us, he lo from the beginning, He loved them, He loved them to the very end. It's a way of life. Love. So when we talk about the love for the Lord's Word, the psalmist is not talking about at this juncture. He's going to share with you as we will study more and more how it works. But where does it begin when we say, teach me? Will you wake up? If someone wants to wake, wake or cause you to wake up, people get up early to go fishing. Right? Over in, in Japan, in Tokyo, Tsukiji. Went to the market there. I was there. Well, let's go to the, go to the Tsukiji market. Five o'clock in the morning. So I reached there about 5.30. The market is closed already. <laughs> why, why you come at 5.30? Yeah, you can have breakfast. So we end up having breakfast there. That was it. All the fish had been sold, auctioned and sold. Oh, we thought 5.30 is very early. <laughs> Depends on what you mean by early. You've got to be kidding. It's over, it's finished. Tsukiji market. Well, that's how it works with... with, with uh, uh, people are willing to go down there. The merchants, are, the fish buyers are willing to be there. At 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, the moment the tide comes in, the fish dog, let's go and buy the things. And they get the best, the, the best of all the catches. 5.30 only for breakfast. Tsukiji market, 5.30 breakfast. Why did I? You, you, what do you think? <laughs> of course, we don't know how many the Japanese people were, were laughing at us. Good thing we don't understand Japanese. <laughs> but because... You don't understand what is happening. You say, okay, you can buy this. But you see, if we really want to, let's go on further. The Lord opened my ear. Maybe tonight God will open your ear and you begin to hear 
God has opened my ear. You know what? I was not rebellious. I nor did I turn my back. <coughs> That's a problem. You see, most people start, okay, I will start tomorrow morning. I will get up very early. First day. Second day, half an hour later. Third day, I forgot. <laughs> and then next week, it's gone. It doesn't work. We want to love the Lord. We want to love His Word. It's got to be our way. It's not a moment. It's not a, a point of time. You know, okay, I made a decision. You don't. When you decide you want to get married, you decide it for life. It may just simply say, I do. You're wondering, should I have said, do I? <laughs> Too late. You know what? You're already married. You know, what's the best thing to do? You cannot undo it. Right? You know, what's the best thing to do? Learn. How do I love you? Let me count the ways. Have we learned? That's what it is. It is a matter of learning. Can it be done? And I'll say to all the student pastors and field, if ever you want a ministry that is significant, it will be tied into the Word of God. This is our 40 plus 5 years of ministry in Bethany. Try preaching Christmas messages 45 times fresh. Try 45 years of Easter messages fresh. I do church family, Indian family camp. I do church family camp. I do Bethel family camp. I do youth conference. I do three Conferences, Bible conferences, pastoral conferences in Myanmar, altogether eight a year. Nothing is ever repeated for 40 years. Never needed to repeat anything. How? You see, I'm a person who likes things fresh. I, I really do. If you ask me the overnight food, I, my stomach will churn. Partly health, partly because after, after a while, it's all, it's all but part of me. If I like to eat things fresh, why can't I study the Word of God fresh? Why cannot I preach the Word of God fresh? Why cannot I love God in a fresh, new way all the time? Because that's how He loves me. New. Every morning it is new. His faithfulness, His loving kindness is new every morning. Why can't mine be fresh and new too? I put myself to shame and the Lord's name to shame if I can't do that. I want to share with you the journey that I took all these years to, to share with you something which is, to me, an absolutely wonderful thing to do. Why am I not retiring yet? As long as the energy, as long as the freshness, as long as the zeal, as long as the strength is there, I want to be there for the Lord. Because it's taken me so many years to learn what I have learned. And I want to share this with you. And right now, perhaps I'm the only person who can share this with you, of 45 years of ministry and counting. We're looking forward to the two bands being ordained next year. We call, we're doing it in, in, in August so that Pastor Chris can be a part of that ordaining council uh, to ordain that ministry. So as much as they're growing, important pressure. And I want to be there for them. And then after that, Eugene, Moses, and John, there will be another two, three years to go for internship and then ordination. By which time I will hit 70 years old. 
And I want to be there to see them ordained. And I want to be there to back them up. And I want to be there to tell them it can be done. And I want to tell them it is more than possible. I want to tell you that it is more than possible to have this love for God's Word. Because there are so many things that we can learn. For children, we can teach them the way of truth from error, right from a young age. We can teach them. And they can learn. They really, really can learn. And I'm just so delighted that they can and they want to learn. It's a question of what happened to us. You know, sometimes the problem is we have not been awakened. Along the way, we fell asleep. Along the way, we spiritually died. Along the way, we've lost our way. And thus, the love for God's Word is lost too. And I think if we are honest, we, this is what it is. So I wrote a poem for us to, to consider, to look at. Your commandments, which I love. So I write in all honesty, to be honest, few can speak of a deep love for the Word of God. We can't speak of a love when we do not fully understand the Lord. The word commandment almost brings dread to our heart. Deep down, we know that from God, we are often far apart. We read His Word, but we do not fully comprehend. There are so many things that we do not truly understand. We can barely speak of reading the Scriptures intelligently, let alone testify of reading it with reverence diligently. Love for God's Word often begins in the humblest of ways. Understanding only comes after going through difficult days. But in the hard times that we sometimes experience in life, God gives us a glimmer of hope that helps us to overcome strife. That initial love must be nurtured through seeking God in prayer. We discover further that His Word enables us to overcome despair. A spark of love begins to grow in the depths of our heart, in time, we can speak of a love that will never depart. That we need that love. Let's not talk about that love for God's Word, but love. Last week, two weeks now, one of the most moving experiences we've had was to see a young set of parents first baby, they gave her a beautiful name. I was in Myanmar, and he wrote me. The grandfather wrote me and said, Pastor, can you minister for us, to us? Our granddaughter, my son's first daughter, is born with what is known as a golden heart syndrome. This baby is born with one hand shot. This baby is born with an ear that is displaced. This baby is born with two ribs missing. This baby is born with a cleft lip so that she cannot even suck. This baby is born with a hole in the heart, nine millimeters large. How would you cope? We need a kind of love and strength and power that only the Word of God can give to us. I went there with the straight from the airport to the hospital. Just to be there with them. To hold their hands and to tell them that we're going to be there for them. And we're going to love them. You know, we look at our children 
to me any child that is just got normal everything is a beautiful child if only we have ears and eyes awakened to see the beauty of our children they don't have to be clever they don't have to be pretty they don't have to be uh, you know anything just their normal every night our hearts go out with them to them in prayer that's how it is with them you know as you look at life and all the many problems and challenges there are problems difficulties we've lived our time we've succeeded in life there are children who are born with not anything at all much and so at the end of the day the father takes over and he says we're going to bring in all the specialists we can we're going to spare no effort we will devote our funds to bring in a specialist to look after the child and we are going to give her a fighting chance in life and we are going to love her. Now I ask the mother, how do you feel? He says, baby needs me and I want to be there for her. Good for you. That's what we need. But without that love, we cannot sustain Without that word, we cannot sustain. Without God, we cannot sustain. We will collapse under the strain. You think that after we will, well, our children are normal and healthy. They won't have problems. They won't have difficulties. How do you know? We have been given the word of God for a reason. And we may find that knowledge and that wisdom and the understanding and the power and that life and the energy that we all badly need. You know, I read the Word of God. You know why? Not because I'm a pastor. You know why? One reason. I need it. You have no idea how much the need is. My church depends on me as pastor. I need, I cannot fail them. I read God's word of sheer need. Think, parents, your children need your knowledge, your wisdom, your strength. How would you give it to them without the word of God? You can't. Husbands, wives, you need each other. There will come difficulties and times in your life which are going to be crushing. Just before I came yesterday, one mother wrote asked me, can, I, can you please help my daughter? She's not doing well in school. She doesn't want to quit. And she's only 15. And I sat down with her. What are you... How do you help her? And so I gave her this, this funny equation. She says she feels like a zero. I said, this is God. You put your zero in and God makes you good. And she woke up and she said, hey, you know what? I want to try it. And so she's trying. I got two people to help her. And they replied, yes, we'll help you. We need each other. I can't be there all the time. We need each other. And I think this is something really wonderful. I, I, I'm so glad to see Michelle. Whenever I travel, she would write to me and she would tell me, I'm praying for you. You know, that brings such a joy to the heart and strength and encouragement. That's what it should be. That's what we want to see. That's what we want to have. But we cannot sustain till we learn how to love God's Word. And that's what this camp is all about. To share with you in real life situations 
how we can do just that. This is something that we all can do. Let's be there for each other. Okay? Well, let's pray together. Brethren, as we pray tonight, as we close the first evening reading God's Word, I want to tell you the biggest problem of all, why we cannot love God's Word, is because our ways are not directed to keep God's ways. And we need to bring this up to the Lord first. Lord, it's true, isn't it? The Lord has to awaken us. The Lord has to awaken our ears to hear His voice speaking to us. Tonight, if God is speaking to your heart, to your ears, what is He saying to you? And I think you know the answer. How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed to the Word of God. Tonight, if God is speaking to your heart, would you respond? Would you not turn your back to God? Would you say, yes, I need this word. Begin this work of making me love your word. It's not going to be an easy process, but it can start in a meaningful way tonight. Our Father, we pray for wisdom to understand your word. We recognize our sinful ways, Lord, that we will declare our ways before you. We ask you to hear this, our prayer. We'll bring a revival to our hearts, we pray. Pray that you will speak to us beginning tonight, throughout the whole camp week. And Lord, bring to us a new sense of understanding of what it means to live for you, to love you, to love your word in a fresh new way. We ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.